This is Outnumbered. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno, here with my co-hosts, Kaylee McEnany and Harris Faulkner. Also joining us today, Morgan Ortegas and Jimmy Fela. Now, breaking new developments in the deadly Uvalde school shooting. The Texas Public Safety Director testifying just a short time ago that law enforcement had enough officers on the scene to have stopped the gunman three minutes after he entered the building and calling the law enforcement response, quote, an abject failure. The stunning new details come as we get the first chilling images from inside the school that day. This surveillance photo you're looking at shows cops with rifles and ballistics shields in the hallway, but they waited another hour to storm the classroom. This photo was taken at the same time, but now you see it's a different angle, and it also highlights that officers were ready to go in, but didn't. And at the end of those 77 minutes, 19 students, including the daughter of one of the officers stationed there in the hallway, and two teachers were dead or dying. Others sustained serious physical injuries. The emotional and psychological harm will be lifelong for survivors and their families. It was the deadliest school shooting in Texas history. Jimmy, in stark contrast to those officers that waited over 90 minutes until he was actually sh shot, when SWAT came, mm -hmm. there was four minutes mm -hmm. in between them arriving and him actually being shot dead. Yeah, I think the problem here is there's so many overlapping timelines and variations of this story, but the one common thread is that with children in the classroom, they waited to go in. And there's no parent watching this. There's certainly no parent victimized by this horrible tragedy. That's okay with them waiting to go in. And that's the big issue here. To hear law enforcement outright condemn this as a failure, it hurts me because I know it hurts them too. They didn't want this outcome. And I say this all yeah. the time. I am embarrassingly supportive of police. I would be a cop if they didn't have a thing called a background check. But the fact that they do means I'm here doing what I do. And I have a lot of empathy for everybody involved. But there's just no world where we're okay with children not being the priority. Because when you hear something like, well, we didn't know if it was an active shooter situation, so we stood down for a minute. There's no world where there's kids in a classroom with a man with a gun and we have like a sliding scale of tolerance. There's no tolerance. They should have been in there, and it hurts me to say that. That's right, and just to be clear, so the Texas police, they entered the corridors of the school 19 minutes mm -hmm. after the gunman entered the building, and then they entered the actual classroom 58 minutes later. Thanks. And Kaylee, to Jimmy's question about the, the children in there, we have now transcripts that are quite damning, unfortunately, for that police chief, but we have on there an officer that said, uh, if there's kids in there, we need to go in there. Another responded, whoever's in charge will determine that. Um, it goes on, we'll get into more of that later, but I know you have part of the timeline of the children who were calling 911 themselves from yeah, inside the room. Absolutely, and you've got to wonder who that officer was. Was it the officer whose daughter was in there? I'm sure he was saying, let's go in. You can't imagine being a parent there. But yeah, it's chilling. You know, Emily, I read this one line that stood out to me in this Texas Tribune, um, kind of expose with a lot of new details. By noon, officers had rifles, a hooligan, and at least one ballistic shield, yet made no attempt to enter the classroom for 50 minutes. So that's according to the Texas Tribune by noon. Well, we have this timeline, much of which was read out to us uh, during one of those press conferences by law enforcement. The timeline says this, 12.03, First 911 call from inside the classroom from a girl, it was this one girl, there had been calls prior, who whispers that she's in the room. She makes a second call at 1210, the same little girl saying multiple people are dead. She makes a third call at 1213. She called again. She makes a fourth call, the same little girl at 1216 and says eight or nine students are still alive. Imagine being this little girl. You've called one time, two time, three time, four time, and then the initial caller who made the first 911 call called at 1236, 1243. She says, please send the police now. Imagine being that little girl who's brave enough to pick up your phone, brave enough to make the call one, two, three, four times. Please, please come. This is a damning timeline. It's catastrophic. And Harris, of course, the investigation is not over, but at the same time, given what we know now, uh, the public is demanding answers, especially the families of those victims. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to wait for all of this to come out, and it won't be easy. The drip, drip. Um, there will be stories that coordinate crossing timeline we now know because 58 minutes is an eternity. So we know that we have video of parents being held on the perimeter, um, some of them with police acting against them. 
you know, reports of pepper spray and of, of, of the, the cuffing of parents um, with the plastic strips. Uh, one mom who managed to get away, makes it to the school, gets her kids out. I mean, there was a lot transpiring potentially that'll overlap that timeline. But two words really stand, stood out to me from your setup to this, and it was death, yeah. dying. The death part we know. Were there people who could have been saved? The dying. And listening to that child and what you just recounted too, Kaylee, there's another word that stands out, and that's bravery. We're the home of the brave. Where was the bravery of these men and women standing outside with uniforms? You go toward the gunshots. You do. And if you aren't brave, sit down and let somebody go who is. That's right. And here's uh, Morgan, there were officers that absolutely acted heroically. I think what we're starting to learn from the drip drip, as Harris mentioned, was sort of the the bureaucratic uh, constraints that some fell under. But however, officers who got to the scene immediately evacuate, evacuated children in other cl classrooms when other officers failed to do so. There were officers fighting to go in the classrooms. We certainly have yes. the transcripts and testimony um, and witness reports of such. So absolutely, including and especially the bravery of that SWAT team, the Border Patrol SWAT, yes. that resulted in the death of that shooter so there was there was while there's immeasurable tragedy there is also immeasurable heroism um, albeit perhaps a bit disproportionate from that day morgan i think that's right I, I i keep the the number that keeps ringing in my ears is when you ladies were talking about at least 50 minutes um, that the parents stood there uh, I, I just think about as a parent standing there for 50 minutes 58 minutes whatever the timeline ultimately ends up being and hearing the gunshots and knowing that your child is in there i i can't think of anything worse and and while we have some really amazing local reporting going on in texas that's getting this out the drip drip that harris is referring to i also think has to be incredibly psychologically damaging for these parents because every other day you're getting confirmed the your worst fears possible um, that the people that were supposed to protect your children did it. And so that's why I think we need to keep pushing. While the local reporting is fantastic, we have to keep pushing for full accountability, for a full report, so that this never happens again. I mean, what about, again, and I don't want to second guess, you know, the cops until we get that full report, but you think about flash grenades or, or the riot gear that the cops have or tear gas, something anything to have disabled the shooter instead of it taking almost a full hour to disable the shooter. Um, and, and so that's the accountability I'd like to see. Where is the, when are we gonna get the full and comprehensive report? Well, where is the line, my life for yours? That's right. I mean, I, I don't wanna turn it to, yeah, I'm not gonna prophesize because that's not my role. The Lord hasn't called me to do that. But I am a witness by trade. And where is that person? There's always one in a disaster, in hurricanes, tornadoes, I've, I've covered that person who decides my life for yours, right. especially for a little one. And if they were arguing about bureaucracy, that to me isn't an argument. Shoot me in the back as I go rescue people. Like, where is that person? Right. And maybe they were there in droves and we don't know yet. Maybe that's the drip trip. I wish they'd spill that faster. That's right. Well, the one officer who showed up just really quickly because he had gotten a call from his wife, who was one of yeah. the teachers, who she said she was bleeding out. She thought he was turned away. So he arrives in the hallway, and according to the reporting I was reading in the Texas Tribune, he was turned away by others. Yeah. Absolutely heartbreaking. And you know, in the, in the, I don't know if it's the manual or the charging papers essentially for law enforcement there, it specifically says if you're not prepared to give your life for others, perhaps yes. this is not the right calling for you. And I think unfortunately, you know, despite or no matter how much training there is and how much logistics and, and, and factors and assets in the school districts that we have, sometimes you can't test the measure of a human until that moment. Yeah. And that's the most frightening part. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.